Okay, we are going to start this first uh, roundtable, as I announced this uh, morning. These are my disclosures. And this roundtable will be about biomechanics of childbirth uh, inside into pelvic floor disorders. As you have listened in the previous session, and as you, all of you know very well, major risk factors for pelvic floor dysfunction is vaginal delivery. But the exact mechanism of injury is unknown. We need to know how the mechanical injuries are produced and how does this, this mechanical uh, injury lead to pelvic floor dysfunction. Biomechanical modeling is a way to understand how vaginal delivery might produce damage on pelvic floor structures. In attempt to better understand the mechanics of childbirth, salvage injury, investigators have turned to comp computational models of the female pelvic floor. Basic research on biomechanics is a promising area of research and also area of collaboration between clinicians, imaging specialists, and biomechanical engineers. Today, we have three experts in this area of research. Dr. Margot Damaster, Dr. Renato Natal, and Dr. Teresa Mascarenas. Margot Damaster is a bioengineer, and also uh, she is uh, the director of the Urological Bio Biomechanics Laboratory located at the Department of Biomechanical Engineering in uh, Urological and Kidney Institute at Cleveland Clinic and the St. Louis Stokes Cleveland Medical Center in Cleveland, Cleveland, Clinic, Cleveland, Cleveland Ohio. She has multiple research projects and especially biomechanical analysis and kinematics and dynamics of the pelvic floor. She is associate professor in the Cleveland Clinic Learned College of Medicine. So I let you now with Dr. Damaset. He will do an introduction, an introduction to the biomechanics and the pelvic floor. So. Thank you, Monsi, for inviting me to speak and for that great introduction. Um, she's asked me to talk on uh, and give an introduction to biomechanics and the finite element method in the context of making predictive models to prevent pelvic floor disorders. So she's given me basically 10 minutes to explain what I spent seven years on my PhD doing. I will do my best. Uh, I have a few research agreements with some um, pharmaceutical companies. None of that work will be discussed in this talk. So in my research group, we have spent a fair amount of time thinking about can we prevent pelvic floor disorders. And um, for a lot of the biomechanics research, we look to the cardiovascular field. And so what is it that we need to know to be able to prevent any disorder? We need to know about the mechanisms and specific risk factors. We need to be able to identify those at risk. So if we look to the cardiovascular field, um, we can think of high blood pressure, and we can identify those with high blood pressure. We can treat high blood pressure, uh, and we can monitor the progress of our treatments by continuing to measure high blood pressure as one example. So can we do this for pelvic floor disorders? Not quite yet, um, but uh, we, will, we will do our best to discuss where we're at in this roundtable. In the last session, we learned that um, the risk factors aren't quite clear uh, from a very large study um, that gave results that disputed what uh, we had prior thought. Um, so even that is not very clear. But we do know that vaginal delivery is a major risk factor. And so that's where we have focused the biomechanical models. So what happens during vaginal delivery here in a cross-section we can see the bladder, vagina, and anus, along with the levator ani. And when the baby's head comes through the birth canal, everything gets crushed and pressed and made ischemic, stretched. So how does this mechanical injury lead to pelvic floor disorders? Uh, and this is the purpose of the models. Um, but uh, we have to first consider, what can we measure during childbirth. Uh, and it's ethically 
um, not acceptable to make many measurements during childbirth. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of examples of measurements that have been made of um, forces and, uh, and other biomechanical parameters during childbirth. Biomechanical parameters divide into two types, kinematic, which is motion and stretch, and dynamic, which is forces and pressures. So in the kinematic area in the 1950s, Borel and Fenstrom did a series of studies where they took x-rays during childbirth. Now, we can't repeat these studies, but we can learn from what they did. And they found that there are only a few millimeters between the baby's head and the mother's pelvic outlet during delivery, so everything else is crushed between. The birth canal is lengthened during delivery, so there's a lot of stretch going on, and the sagittal diameter of the pelvic outlet increases by two centimeters or more with the baby's head, so more stretch. The uh, biomechanical dynamic studies of childbirth are a little bit more recent and a little bit more feasible um, when these have been done by sliding a very narrow gauge pressure transducer up into the uterus and, uh, and measuring pressures along the entire birth canal. So the baby's head to cervix pressures can be very high, up to 500 millimeters of mercury, which is high enough to damage muscles and nerves. Um, and the head to cervix forces are higher in women delivered vaginally than in women with cesarean section, as we would expect. The pressure on the fetal head is twice the amniotic pressure and increases towards the end of labor. So all these are very important for forming the models as model inputs, um, but they are insufficient to create an entire model in which you would need to include material properties, geometry, the relative importance of structures. Some structures maybe don't need to be included in the model. And forces and pressures on individual tissues. By material properties, this is again a biomechanical term, um, I mean the um, stiffness of a material, for example. In this case, because we're dealing with contractile tissues, the contractile properties of a tissue. And, uh, and there's a fun story of uh, my colleague James Ashton Miller, who's a biomechanical engineer with expertise in orthopedics and musculoskeletal systems. He started collaboration many years ago with James, with um, John DeLancey, University of Michigan, to study pelvic floor biomechanics. And they didn't have material properties for pelvic floor structures, so they used the material properties that he was used to using for musculoskeletal and orthopedic structures. And when John DeLancey called the lab to see what the outcome of the model was, they said, childbirth can't happen. <laughs> so we have to know what we're dealing with, and we have to validate it. But we have to make some assumptions. Um, and these are actually very difficult in our field. Um, but there are many fields where the measurements are easier to make, and they're further ahead of us. And so these are the fields we look to. One of them, actually, is architecture. Um, and mechanical modeling, of course, isn't done now the way it was done in Gaudi's day, but he makes a, a fascinating example of classical mechanical modeling. Um, and for those of you who have been to Pitrera, you will know. Um, and for those of you who have not yet been to La Pretera, you should go. I apologize for my pronunciation. So he wanted to make um, cantilevered, uh, domed structures for the ceiling of the attic. And um, he wanted it to follow a catenary curve, which is the hanging curve for any rope or string that is hung from two points. And you see that in the top right figure. He created a physical, mechanical structure, hung these ropes, studied them, and then reversed them for the arches that he used to create the ceiling in the attic. Now, of course, we use computers aerospace industry, automobile industry, and weather mapping predictions are way ahead of us. So there's a lot we can learn from them. I'm not going to spend much detail on this slide. Uh, Renato will actually go into more detail of the methods of um, biomechanical modeling, finite element simulation. But it's a process of forward simulation from small structures up to the whole organ and then back. When the whole organ changes, the forces on the interior structures have to change. So we come back to the question, can we use these models to predict pelvic floor dysfunction? Not quite yet, but we're working on it. 
Uh, we need to include in the models probably cellular and molecular data, kinematic and dynamic data, anatomic variability. I'm sure you all can think of many other bullet points. And I believe we will need to use data from animal models because we just can't get the data we need from human. So I'm going to give just a couple examples from the Ashton Miller and uh, John Delancey group. Um, they've done some modeling, uh, modeling the fetus as a sphere, and you will see more complex models from my colleagues here. Uh, it looks like a bowling ball going to, through the birth canal. So it gives you a sense of the assumptions that have to be made. The models are very complex, computationally heavy. Their model includes only the muscles and this bowling ball of a fetus because that's what they were interested in studying. And they predict that the levator ani muscles are stretched more than 50% beyond the strain threshold for permanent damage. They also predict that the pudendal nerve is stretched beyond the strain threshold for permanent damage in nerve. Uh, so these are important starts to making predictive models. So we come back once again to the four bullet points. Uh, much work is yet to be done. You'll hear about the great work that's going on. And there's a lot of work being done in other fields, orthopedics, dental, architecture, uh, cardiovascular, that we can learn from as well. So I thank you for your attention, and I give the floor to the next speaker.